let's jump to our our next horrible horrible. Um, Chris Salcedo has uh, um, Matt Gates on. Blech. All right, on you quit smoking pot. Fantastic. SpaceX sending a rocket with uh, oh with the space tourists. I see. Um, yeah, Summer will be upstairs watching that. I have no doubt. It's an ad for nuclear socks. Yay, we got 420 likes. See, it's perfect timing for somebody who just quit pot. It's good. Um, this is, this is Salcedo. January 6th, what really happened? A bunch of Trumpers stormed the Capitol, uh, attempting to install their asshole leader at, who lost an election as a permanent dictator in a democracy, and they failed. That's what happened. That's what really happened. But, um... If true, General Milley has broken some very good... What does that even mean? Hold on. They didn't they, they didn't write out what he said, did they? Hold on, I've got Mike Lindell ads running in the background. What really happened? This is part of our ongoing series, our top story. This week, federal authorities have arrested 15 more individuals on charges related to the Capitol riot. Court records reveal some charges are as minor as trespassing. As minor... As trespassing. Thank you, Environmental Coffee House. Thank you for being... Hold on. What are you, I, it's scrolling past, so I want to look at it. Thank you for letting me shamelessly self-promote on your channel. My name is Sandy, and I've been doing this for seven years now. We are a climate change science channel. Uh, well, excellent. Keep at it. I would love to come on and discuss it with you. So, hi. Meantime, thousands of BLM and Antifa rioters have had charges dropped after beating, looting, and burning their way through our streets. Well, no, the charges were dropped against the people who were just... Uh, protesting who got lo lo like lumped in with the people who were beating people and doing violent shit. For years, joining me now to discuss is Florida Congressman Matt Gates. Congress Jesus Christ. Oh, God. He looks more and more like a character from an M. Night Shyamalan movie every time. It was always great to have a conservative here on the show. You know, Oh, by the way, in case you don't know what conservative means, it currently means uh, um, child sex trafficker. Apparently. With big boy hair and a, and a creep grin. Honest Democrats in and out of the press have called the events of January 6th an armed insurrection, yet no one has been charged with insurrection or sedition. Now, I've said that... One second. Um, hold on. Charges, January 6th. A lot of people have been charged, by the way, with, um, uh, let's see. Here you go. Here's a search. Oh, it's, where's the table? Let me bring this up real quick. Where's the, I have a chart. Hold on. Here we go. All right. Bring this up. Take that ad out. Take this guy. Make it a little bigger so I can show it to you guys. There you go. So nobody's been charged with, no thanks. Nobody has been charged with insurrection is the, is the assertion by Chris Salcedo. This took me all of, um, what, 12 seconds? Who, yeah, who is watching Nestor, by the way? Um, these are, this is a, the people have been charged uh, so far. Let's see, uh, da, da, da. page one of 80. So, dink, 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 dink. Okay, so no one's been charged with uh, insurrection. Well, insurrection is a descriptive, it is not a legal term about what these folks are doing. In an insurrection, there are things you would do. The first one would be trespassing. Entering the place where you intend to carry out the other stuff. Now, the intent to carry out the thing if you never got inside or you were driven back by tear gas or those kind of things, um, they can't prove that you wouldn't have... They got you on trespassing, but they can't prove you did anything else. Um, Robbie, okay, Raphael, thanks. Um, uh, so, but when you get... Let's let's go with uh, good old Ronald McAbee. Um, assaulting, resisting, or impeding certain officers... Uh, with inflicting bodily injury and aiding and abetting, assaulting, resisting, impeding certain officers, entering or remaining in a restricted building or grounds with a deadly or dangerous weapon. Um, that's the whole, like, that nobody was armed. Uh, disorderly and disruptive conduct in a restricted building or grounds with a deadly or dangerous weapon. By the way, you weren't allowed to be in the Trump uh, 
crowd with a gun. It's Washington, D.C. So the idea that, like, they weren't armed at the Capitol. They didn't have a choice. If they could have, you don't think that Trump, if, if Trump could have had his crowd, like, with loaded AR-15s, he wouldn't have had them on the lawn? Are you fucking kidding me? Um, knowingly enter, uh, enter or remain in a restricted building or grounds without lawful authority to do so with the intent to impede or disrupt the orderly conduct of governmental business or functions engage in disorderly or disruptive conduct in which the proximity to a restricted building on the grounds when or so such that, uh, so that such conduct in fact impedes or disrupts the orderly conduct of government business or official functions, disorderly conduct in the Capitol grounds, obstruction of an official proceeding. These are all the things prosecutors allege Duong, uh, this is Fi Duong, is interested in violence, Molotov cocktails, and militias. That was part of his thing. Um, Michael Carrico, there's th this dude, look at Thomas Ballard stacking him up. Assaulting, resisting certain officers using a dangerous weapon, civil disorder, entering or remaining in restricted grounds, uh, disorderly disruptive con and disruptive conduct, uh, physical violence in a restricted building or grounds with deadly or dangerous weapon, disorderly conduct in Capitol building, act of physical violence in the Capitol grounds or buildings, parading, demonstrating, or picketing in a Capitol building. This is probably is that the dude with the uh, the Confederate flag? Um. Disorderly and disruptive conduct in a restricted building, entering or remaining on the floor of Congress, parading, demonstrating, or picketing, knowingly or remaining in any restricted building on grounds without lawful authority. Um, these are like dudes who got into the actual place. So the idea that uh, nobody's been charged with insurrection is is like saying, well, yeah, the Trump organization is uh, is charged with um, communicating unlawfully um, and without. Uh, registering as a foreign agent with Russians, providing them with details, allowing them control over uh, the RNC, um, like the ratification of the RNC platform, those kind of things. But nobody's ever charged with collusion. Right. Rioters have legal cases against some of those who are defaming them in the press and other, and other places. But Congressman, is there justification for violent left-wing rioters and looters walking free when trespassers and vandals on January 6th are being held indefinitely. Is that equal justice? Uh, they're not being held indefinitely. They are being held until trial because they are potentially violent. That's not indefinitely. That you, there's a definite end. And by the way, a bunch of these assholes would be out already. A lot of them are on ankle monitors, but they scream obscenities into their microphone and smash shit or yell at their, and keep firing their lawyers or lie or say they are not subject to the U.S. judicial system. Yeah, you're not going to get to, yeah, we're going to release you on your own recognizance. You don't have an ID. You don't believe in America. You don't, you think cops are invading on your sovereign space if they ask you a question, but please. It's not, and we've seen the top leader. It's not what? That equal justice? Um, it's not equal justice? It, for, well, first of all, it's bullshit. It doesn't exist. So it's hard to argue what it is or what it isn't. It's not, and we've seen the top leaders in the Democratic Party gaslight for a process that seems to always make excuses for left-wing purveyors of violence, uh, excuses that really call into question whether or not there's a two-tier system of justice. We can. There isn't. Well, there, I, I take it back. You know what? You know what? There is. There is a two-tiered. Uh, um, hold on. This guy right here. My background. There you go. Uh, need to stretch this guy out. Bugging me. Um, there's a a, a two tier system of justice. How? Hold on. Okay. Oh, I see. That's something else. Okay, good. We're fine. To ask questions. There, there, there is a, what I was saying was I just fix something. Um, there is a two-tiered system of justice. There is a tier of justice for those that can be released on their own recognizance and show up for court and be tried later, um, like uh, traffic stops, violations. And then there's a tier of justice for people who cannot be trusted to participate in normal society between now and their court hearing because they might fucking kill someone, burn down a building, or decide to join with a bunch of the other like-minded assholes and try to Timothy McVeigh their way across the country. 
So they're in a different tier. We, for example, we have felonies and we have misdemeanors. Treatment of January 6th detainees, their access... Detainees. Oh, my God. That... <sighs> why don't you just... Why don't you just call them political prisoners at this point? Why don't you just start calling them, you know, the Navalny 260? The council. But here's what's really happening. Whoa! I beg your pardon? January 6th detainees, their access to council. They all have access to council. They all, what are you talking about? They all have access to counsel. They all have lawyers. Some cases, multiple lawyers. They all have a public defender. There's a difference between, and perhaps uh, you could find a conservative to tell you this, but there's a difference between um, being offered help and shunning help and not getting help. Someone offers to help you, you tell them to go fuck themselves and then complain no one is helping me. That's, that's his idea of their being denied right to counsel. Here's what's really happening, Chris. Oh boy, here's what's really happening. The, the Department of Justice has to maintain this theory that the January 6th de detainees maintain an ongoing threat to the... First of all, they're not detainees. They're, I mean, they, they've been indicted. They've been charged with a crime. And by the way, do you think Matt Gates give a, gives a rat fuck about any other people who are being held f till trial? And, and by the way, these are the assholes who were saying um, the Democrats want to end cash bail. Remember that nonsense? United States, so that they are able to take the national security apparatus and turn it against our people. America first. Bullshit. We put criminals in jail until their trial all the time. That's why most of the people who get, uh, you know, uh, smaller sentences get credit for time served because they were in jail that whole fucking time. Or you can get, I mean, like the really lax DAs these days, you can get time served for probation because you were on an ankle monitor. You get like two years probation, but you've had an ankle monitor for three months waiting for trial, so you get three months shaved off your probation. It's such a strong political movement. It is so threatening to the elite that they are... The elite? You mean, I'm sorry, you mean armed, like, you mean officers? You mean citizens walking around? The federal uh, executive branch with the FBI taking people's financial records in mass from institutions like Bank of America. They're even using the Congress. They're not they taking them in mass. They're getting warrants for specific people. There's just a lot of these fuckers. There's like hundreds of these things. Yeah, because there were thousands of people who charged the Capitol. Pelosi's hyper-partisan January 6th committee placing demands. On why, why was it hyper-partisan? There's, there's Republicans on there. Why is it hyper-partisan? Because you couldn't get your hyper-partisans on there? Nice. Phone records of myself and my colleagues like... Yeah, and then now we get to it. Now we get to why language like detainees and elites and the movement and this is huge and it's gigantic and they're attacking the movement. They're not seeking my records and my fellow uh, congresspersons uh, records because we were engaging with strategy with these assholes. No, that's not why. Taylor Green, Lauren Boebert, Madison Cawthorn, a lot of the folks that you see on Newsmax, a lot of the... A lot of the folks uh, who uh, were hoping to be able to step down and get a job at Newsmax, but were turned down because they suck. And uh, and a lot of the folks who were talking to rioters on the day, telling them where Nancy Pelosi was. ...that actually fight for the country. So it's on. Nancy Pelosi is there to seize power. The Biden regime... S seize power? She's the Speaker of the House. The Biden regime. Detainees and the Biden... I mean, they're basically just trying to weaponize language we use about Russia or China. So they're basically saying that America 
is no better than China or Russia. So they basically are messaging arms of the of of the of the C the um the CCP and uh, I guess Russian uh, Russian intelligence is there to seize power. And the question is, if the voters seize power, he won the election, fucko. <laughs> yeah, the Biden regime seized power by being elected democratically. Trust us again if we get those gavels to be able to perform the oversight that your preamble lays out is so badly needed. Will we actually do it? Will we step? No, no, you will not seize power again. You're going to lose next time. You're going to lose a bunch of seats. You're going to see a you'll be you'll see a lot of squealing on the hyper left because they're going to run in a lot of purple districts. Instead of trying to motivate the base to vote, they're going to try to motivate a volume of voters because now the language. By the way, just get used to this idea. Purple states. The idea that both Republicans and Democrats have had for a long time is that since it's up to primary voters and the and and sort of almost like a a, a fan base level arrival at midterms, the idea is that you your strategy is about putting the mo the firebrands into these purple districts, not moderates. That you put you know, and it never works. It never works uh, on either side. It does not work. Um, they occasionally squeak through because they ran on something moderate, which is what they tried with like Nina T Turner in um in Cleveland, you know, in that area. Um, which the air it was just odd because the ads she was running made her look like a moderate. It was very strange. My I family there, I was there while that campaign was going on. I was watching the ads on television. It did not look like a you know the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party is ascendant in Cleveland. It looked like she was running. Um, to be to be the Secretary of State under a, an independent party, it, or you know who leans Republican, it was very strange, um, and just happened to be black. That was like that's what the ad campaign it looked like every day, and, that, and there were lots of them. They had plenty of money, but it didn't work. It did not work. And so what you're going to see the major parties, both Republicans and Democrats, and this is what Matt Gates is afraid of, and what Marjorie Taylor Greene is afraid of, and what Lauren Boebert is afraid of, is that they're the ones who are going to get replaced in these edges, like in Georgia and Colorado and Florida in a lot of ways, where Democrats have set their sights on them. They're going to start pushing in um, moderate Democrats um, who are, you know, sensible kind of, you know, party normalcy, blah, blah, blah. They're going to sell that as opposed to trying to get just the, the fringe out to vote in a low turnout election. They're counting on all elections being national because of Trump for the next couple decades. So, yeah. So, um, in this particular, uh, you know, situation, he's in a district where that could happen as well, where the Republicans are afraid they're going to lose to a moderate Democrat who is going to run against, why'd you guys elect a scumbag like this? A lot of military people, a lot of, um, you know, civil servants running, um, and there will be a strategy around this. This is happening nationwide. This is, I mean, I'm letting you know, this is how this is going to operate. It's not because I'm in line with the DNC or I know, um, you know, anybody at the RNC that's whispering this. You can see it. You can see the material changes, especially in the purple states, is it is not going to be the fringe that punches through. Everyone is trying to find the most motivational moderate they can possibly find. That's the, I mean, it's, it, that's the strategy. And the people who are in danger because of that um, are... Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene and those crowds. They're the ones who are going to, they could get, even in a red district, they're, because they've gone, they've jumped the shark with this bullshit, they're going to get swamped by these folks. They're going to get swamped by what's effectively a normal um, Democrat. That, that's why they're freaking out about this. I'm just letting you know. Um, and I think the September 18th thing is going to be a fucking mess and fight for the people who send us to fight for them. They didn't send, nobody sends you to fight. I'm fucking sick of the word fight when it comes to politics. I'm tired of it. You're a gardener. Run as a goddamn governor, you know, a, a gardener. Like you show up, prune the weeds, make the plants grow, try to work really hard to bring as much life to the situation. Fighting is bullshit. It just ends up yelling. You don't change. The only fight that matters is the one where you actually change someone's mind. And the people who, who, use the most fight-ready language, aren't changing anybody's minds. They're not getting anybody to cross over to their idea. And I don't mean across party lines. I mean internally.
The language around fighting when it comes to democracy is bullshit. And I would argue it is every bit as much a strategy of, uh, you know, of foreign interference in our elections, getting that word to be the primary word to describe our political act um, for the last 15 years. The fight language is just bullshit. It's bullshit. You're not running to be a fighter. You're involved in governance, in a democracy. And none of these assholes have ever been in a real fight. Thanks. Can't stop lying. I, I'm, I, like, have you ever been in a real fight? Have you ever been in a real fight? Like, uh, this could go south and somebody might not leave moment? You don't use this kind of language when you've been in a real fight. Or you know what a real fight is. Because, honestly, we're in a, we're in a political uh, period, like an, uh, the era of, of louder instead of better, smarter. We need a socialist party. No, we don't. Um, uh, it'll, it'll never happen. There, there, is no, there is no functioning version of socialism that exists in the world and there'll never be one in the United States. It, I'm honest to God. It's just not going to. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of writing a book called Sparxism. Um, for all the Sparxists out there, that is uh, my my political philosophy about stuff. But yeah, they talk, government is not a sport. That's exactly right. This is not a sport. It's not a fight. It's gardening. It's work. It's compromise. I'm sorry, but it, if you want democracy to work, then the word fight's got to go. And And what does the fight actually mean when people say this? What do they say? What, like, what does fighting usually mean? It means yelling at rallies. Well, that's what Trump did. Being the loudest person with a microphone at a rally is not the most motivational, moving, or mind-changing thing anyways. Usually, you're only that loud when you're preaching to the choir anyways. It's work. That's exactly right. I'm there to work for you. Right. It's time we, you know, the whole like roll up their sleeves, come in there. Like Katie Porter, for example, didn't run as a fighter. Katie Porter is not a fighter. She doesn't use fight language. She's fucking brilliant. Work smart, not hard. You're not there to punch people. You're there to solve problems. You're a sparxist? Yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a great way to overwhelm the you know language. Yeah, Americans rather go fascism rather than socialism, and I'm a French socialist. French socialism doesn't exist. I mean, it just it yeah. Materially, it, what you have is democratic taxation. Everything we call socialism in our country is democratic taxation, and it works. It just doesn't. It just doesn't have a word like socialism that sounds good. Social socialism sounds like social security, and that's why people talk like that. Socialism is not social safety net. It just isn't. Socialism is government is the government is is corporations mixed together. Like it, that's what they have in China right now. It's a mess. Sparxist, yeah, <laughs> I think so. Um, Sparxism is a thing. The primary thing on Sparxism: be nice. And if you can't be nice, no, be kind. If you can't be kind, be nice. If you can't be nice, be funny. So there you go. Um, anyways, so fighting is dumb. The, the language around fighting is silly, especially when it comes to politics. It's ridiculous. It, it, it's meaningless. It's, it's not even that like, well, it should be or we can't, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Francois Mitterrand ended up only creating things that were like the social safety net we have in, here in the country. It, it, it was not an alignment of government and production. That's what socialism is. Yeah, don't be a dick. Exactly. Um, unless you actually are one and then do your job. Um, I suppose. Totally vote for a Sparxist. High priest of Sparxism. That's great. Uh, yeah, I think I just accidentally launched something. Sparxism. I should have like a little like thing that comes up sparks today's sparksism and a little like if this happens think this or, you know like a, a, a little phrase like the more you know I'll, I'll work on it that'd be cool be nice with the rule for roadhouse that's right are you still running for mayor of los angeles i am i filed i'm i'm, I'm officially running i've got a um i'm it, there's a bunch of stuff i have to do before i can start raising money and that kind of stuff and that won't be till the end of the year so 
Yeah. But yes. Be kind and just, right. Fighting benefits no one. It Well, it, it, an actual fight, it might. You might save your own life or someone else's. I don't have a problem with fighting ever. I, I'm a fan. I've practiced and studied fighting my whole goddamn life. I know the value of fighting. But that's not what democracy is. Sp uh, fighting as a political thought form is, is a holdover from monarchies and theocracies and dictatorships. Because that was the only way they solved it. Well, our king fights your king with using his people versus their people. That's it. I'm a Sparxist t-shirt. Excellent. My, my platform, uh, about seven inches. Um, the, the ones that Paul Stanley wore with the stripes on Love Gun. Um, yeah, Sparxism. It could be good with an X. That's fine. I'm okay with that. It's spelled either way. So, it, that is a, the idea of fighting as a form of, you know, functioning governance is a holdover from monarchies. And it's just silly. And anybody who goes, I'm going to fight for you, they just mean they're going to yell and then they're going to go grease their own palm. Even democratic socialism is not democratic socialism. There are no democratic socialists who are looking for the government to control the means of, of production or be half owner in all businesses. The only reason we use the word socialism as often as we do in, uh, you know, in, in the democratic circles is because there isn't a better word that's shorter for what we're talking about, which is democratic taxation. It just doesn't sound sexy. It does, And because the Republicans are always attacking communism and socialism and tagging us with it, we think, um, you know, you know, we are, you know, democratic socialism is not the proper allocation. That's democratic taxation. It's not socialism because that means it would supersede whatever the democracy wants and pick some, you know, only certain businesses, that kind of thing. How I will pay-per-view to see debates. How I will destroy it. I can do it. I shut down if I'm yelled at. Well, that's why I don't think it's valuable. That's why we have to have conversations about this stuff. Most of the people who are yelling are afraid that if anybody else has heard, they'll, the, the audience will not believe them. And therefore, their opinion, their point of view, their political theory will fall apart because a, a group of people don't understand it or it isn't heard because that person's talking louder. And so therefore they have to talk louder than that person. And then two people talking loudly at each other is called a political fight when it is ab absolutely not. It's two assholes yelling. <laughs> potato soup, the official food. Yes, right, potatoes and soup, right. Five eggs. Uh, one in 500 Americans has died of COVID. Right, Joy, we've talked about this. Might be sparkling, so that could work. They all work. They're good. This is a horrible face to join in the chat. Matt's not. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, we'll move on. Since you brought up Pelosi and Cheney and oh, by the way, one of the other sparksisms before I move on um, is um, I'm telling you, I get to tell you my opinion without insisting it must change yours. That's something I think that I I try to make clear on my tweets a lot of times that people don't seem to grasp sometimes is that, you know, I think, you know, that like I would never, when I say I would never do something and people jump in there going, well, what if this and that, that, I've already made my decision about this. You can go, I would answer it with what you would do, but don't try to weasel my opinion or my idea. I mean, you could chip at it, I guess, but by saying what you would do. That's how we reach these things. I've come to the, that's why, you know, it, 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 the most recent one was when I came up, you know, I was talking about, and thanks for bringing up the COVID, um, you know, conversation about how many people have died from it is that, you know, I, even if I don't, I can't stand Andy vaxxers I can't stand the Alex Joneses of the world, all those folks. I, I, I find them disgusting human beings. Um, I think they're idiots and I think some of them are genuinely mentally ill but I'm never going to wish illness and death on them. I, I'd rather uh, live with a bunch of assholes who are patting themselves on the back, thinking that they are right, um, and argue with them on the merits than have someone be on a ventilator and die with regret talking to their, their family members through a goddamn iPad.
Always. Sorry. I, and I've dealt with, and you guys know this, in the last year, I've dealt with, you know, I, I've had like five deaths close to me at, you know, around this time. And previous to that, in, in like the two years before COVID, during the early part of the Trump years, um, a couple of people passed that I was, that were in my sort of family circle that I was not friends with um, the, anymore or that I'd had a distance from or whatever. But I, I did not wish that on them. I couldn't stop it from happening, but I would never wish it on them. And I would never go, oh, let them... I'll let you guys, you have to say this, you know, you have to, you'll, this is karma. This is Darwinism or whatever. I don't wish Darwinism or karma on anyone. Karma is, by the way, a multi-lifetime thing. So, I, and again, I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm not telling you how to live your life. I'm not telling you how to clear your conscience. I'm not telling you how, what your ethical floor should be. This would be a sparksism. Never wish ill on another unless you are absolutely willing to carry it out yourself in the moment. Because I got to say, watching the Nasser hearings this morning um, with the gymnasts that were out there, that I, as a father, I had a moment where I uh, became so enraged. If I, was, if I had been in the room when something like that happened, and again, there's a difference. That's why we have a judicial system. It's always You can always be wrong. That's why I'm against the death penalty. Not because some people don't deserve to die, but because if you screw up, you can't undo it. That's why. That's enough. That's right. There's no perfect justice. Thanks, Bob. There is no perfect justice. And therefore, I would rather keep some evil person alive in a cell for the rest of their life than accidentally kill someone innocent. Period. End of story. That's it. That's the only reason. If there was some way to be perfect, you know, then we'll talk. But that's just not possible. And in the, yeah, I, it was hard, Francie. I watched a little bit of it, but social, Norway and Sweden are not socialist. Um, they're capitalists and Sweden's a monarchy. Um, they just have big social safety nets. And even then it's, it's taxation based. It's democratic taxation. It's, uh, I'm, I, I love you guys. I'm just trying to tell you, you're clinging to a word. It's the, it's the system that you want. Um, and it, and that system is not that word, but whatever. Anyways, point being uh, if, if I had stumbled upon a circumstance like that and there was a cinder block nearby, it would have been awful. How would you be okay releasing Robert Kennedy's killer? No, I think he should stay in jail forever. No one's releasing, uh, RFK from the cemetery. There's no parole from cemeteries. You kill somebody, you, it's the long goodbye. You stay in a cell forever. If you were a minor, we'll talk. If you have... Uh, if you're mentally ill and they can medicate you and fix it and in a way that, like, if you skip your pill, you're not going to go crazy and kill somebody else and you're a threat to society. And then that's why we need, uh, why we would need institutions for people who are uh, violently mentally ill in those circumstances. That, that It's a complex problem. Anyway, so that's, that, uh, that's why I talk about it, these things in the way that I talk about it, and why I can laugh with such a free conscience when we're talking about this, this stuff and why... When I see these guys co-opting the exact same language the left uses about these things, it, you know, it, this is a bad path to go down. Schiff and crying Kinsinger, among others, they have no interest in stopping ongoing left-wing organized crime. Sp uh, ongoing left-wing organized crime. Left-wing organized crime. Perhaps he'll give us an example. Does he mean like Seth Rogen bailing out protesters who got scooped up with rioters? By BLM and Antifa terrorists. Estimates out there. Um, charges dropped for hundreds of BLM rioters. No, protesters. It depends on if they were really rioting or not. Perhaps that's why. Perhaps they were scooped up with other people. Perhaps you got 10 innocent people in with one guilty person and the DA had to kick everybody to the curb because they couldn't guarantee that those nine people yet yet an equal amount of evidence for 10 people. Say that small businesses took a hit alone, just small businesses alone, over $1 billion and counting. It, is it a double standard? Yeah, but the, 
the left didn't get that. If Here's the thing. Okay, Salcido, I know you're dumb. But if you're going to make this case, what you have to do is go, we found out that Nancy Pelosi's husband owns a real estate insurance firm that gouged prices in Portland and in Oakland and in and and then and minute and Minneapolis three days before George Floyd was killed curiously and all of a sudden and then and then they wouldn't pay out they refused to pay for these small businesses and they made the government pay for it and they kept the huge fees and stuff I mean that would be organized crime that would that's how that would work out that's how you know but that that a couldn't and wouldn't happen and yeah and he also there's no situation where he's even able to make this uh how's the only person what was that who's been able to give a thorough explanation why the death penalty is wrong yeah susan i mean that's it i mean it's not that death is the problem sometimes it's the solution in certain circumstances Hence shootings when police do them sometimes. And they and the vast majority of them, they're being fired upon. They, you don't want that person running around your neighborhood killing other people. You don't. But you find somebody weeks later using evidence that was put there and witnesses, or you have somebody testify against them that shared a cell with them, and then they get a death, you know, they they get it's a capital offense and stuff, and then you find out 10 years later that that person was lying or paid the lie or whatever, like. Yeah, dead's forever. You can fix, you can let somebody out of jail for, you know, been for 25 years and go, sorry, we were wrong. Here's, you know, $5 million. Get on with your life. That's how the cookie crumbles. That's life. It's terrible. You're only a subject because you were domestic, you had committed three acts of domestic violence previously. You know, those kind of things. Don't pretend you were innocent. Just take the money and go home. That kind of idea. Um, but death is forever. And if you can screw that up, don't. The, the reason why so many people uh, look at the January 6th commission, this double standard, they look at it and they go, wow, you, don't, you, you just want to focus on one day. Meanwhile, you've got billions and billions of dollars of damage being done to America. Yeah, that's private damage. And those people are being arrested. The FBI is looking for folks. They've got posts all over the place. They've been seeking them all year. People got arrested and stayed in. Judge, some judges let people out because they said, all I was doing was protesting. I didn't do anything. I wasn't there. And then they get caught again. And then they get caught again. And then they finally go, okay, fuck off. You're going to jail. You're going to stay there. You're an arsonist. This has nothing to do with politics. And by the way, if you burn or loot something uh, during a, a protest like that, looting when there's a hurricane or something like that, when if it's not a television set, if it's food and clothing and those kind of things, eh, there's, a, there's an element of logic and forgiveness to that. Especially things like, I don't know, water and, and, and you know, cans of stuff that you might need, um, you know. Soup for my family. Exactly. Like when you need something like that. But uh, that's wholly different. Private violence, you know, then, then you're to the same scale as somebody does a smash and grab unrelated to politics, the law still applies equally. You broke in to steal something or you broke in to set fire to something. And so there's distinct laws. There's a very distinct law about that because it's set as a, a random or directed act. And so the judge has to judge accordingly. This is why hate crime laws are valuable. It's why you have hate crime laws. Because when someone is generic in their violent activities, they are more of a threat to the public than somebody that just punches you in the face because they have an argument with you. If Dave hates Gary and Dave beats Gary up and Gary wants him charged with assault and they go to court and they, he can argue, well, he was doing this and I was doing that. And we, we have a history of just the two of us and he swung at me first and I think he pushed and, but, but he deserved it and he's a dick. If you talk to him, there, that's, then the, and the law will often go, okay, you guys, you're going to pay a fine and go to jail for 30 days, but there's a you, you guys can't be within 500 yards of each other because that's you and Gary's problem, right? Dave and Gary have that problem. But if Dave just goes, anybody who looks like Gary is a problem, then Dave is a special danger because Gary knows to look out for Dave. Dave's fucking crazy, and he's always trying to attack Gary. That Gary knows. All the other Gary's walking around who look like Gary, but don't know Dave at all, are just doing whatever, and this asshole rolls up and attacks them, 
they are they are in more physical danger because they are not they're not expecting a threat. They are uh, more apt to the the violence can carry on. Anybody who helps said Gary in this circumstance, um, in this particular you know analogy that I'm doing with Dave and Gary, anybody that Dave attacks as Gary who helps this Gary, Sam comes in to help. They're like, what are you doing to this guy? Now Sam is also a Gary. That's a problem. That's a, that's a particular threat. It's why cop killers go to jail longer or people who kill first responders go to jail longer. Not because the individual lives of those people necessarily mean more, although there's an argument that they are, you know, they rush to dangerous situations and therefore, you know, hats off to them in that regard. The reason is, is because if you're willing to kill one of those folks, you have no compunction about killing a random citizen who isn't armed, who isn't a, you know, an officer of the state, right? So that's why we have hate crime laws. It's why they're valuable. Okay. So the difference between, and this is the same pushback, understand what's going on here. This is the same pushback that Salcedo and Matt Gates are giving here that they do against hate crime laws. Because while BLM was a political protest, there was a mix of people smashing and grabbing and targets and or burning stuff down because of a mix of political ideology. But it wasn't to bring target to its knees. It wasn't to stop um, shoe stores from existing. It wasn't directed at those businesses um, like systemically, right? But the attack on January 6th was a specific attack on our way of governance, on our democracy, which is, by the way, the shield that protects all the other stuff, including those targets and those Starbucks and those local mom and pops and the black owned businesses that were destroyed or, or burned or looted during some of the riots. Right? So they have a problem with the January 6th people being thrown in jail because they also have a problem with hate crime legislation. Because they want the pass that this was just random. Trespassing is trespassing. I mean, I, mean, I step over a fence, piss in somebody's yard because I got a flat tire and I didn't want to walk across and it was the nearest tree. That's trespassing. And shitting on Nancy Pelosi's desk while stealing her laptop. That's also trespassing. I mean, they're the same, aren't they? That's the argument they need to make. That's how they water this down over time. Over two years. Isn't that the biggest, I, I don't know, that the biggest... Yes, you don't know. ...delegitimizing factor for this whole January 6th commission. No. Because it was not an attack on... Starbucks as a whole. It wasn't it wasn't an attack on Starbucks's way of life. Well, of course, and when you look at gravity, you can even look to the FBI's own conclusion that there was no organizing apparatus for whatever bad things happened on January. No, there were multiple organizing factors. There was not one overarching group. There were four or five. The communications between them have yet to be found, but that doesn't mean they won't be found. That, mean, that doesn't mean they won't exist. And by the way, the, uh, the former Trump officials are not forthcoming with their communications on that day. They're going to be a little pissed when that stuff happens. Hence the um, preserve all records stuff, which is why, you know, Kevin McCarthy and all those guys are pushing back. And that bears a stark contrast to the highly organized BLM Antifa effort that even had members of Congress and the sitting vice president now of the United States raising money to pay for the bail of people to be able to get right back out on the streets and do that violence and really... Well, no, they were doing it for protesters because protesters were getting scooped up in this shit because it was all happening together. And by the way... If you want to start organizing for bail and law and like that, here's, oh God. So this is also something kind of like that just, so remember when Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene went down to the, uh, I, I guess it was the DC jail where apparently none of these people are being held, but they were like, we're not sure who's being held there or if they're being held. I mean, they could call their fucking lawyers and they weren't allowed in and all that bullshit. Um, let me, uh, let me, I'm going to back up. Listen, listen to this shit again. What he's about to say. Hold on. For the bail of people to be able to get right back out on the streets and do that violence and really engage. Okay. He is currently advocating for the detainees to be released because they're being in, they're being held indefinitely. So he's asking for the exact same thing. 
He's also saying that uh, the left organized so that they could get right back out and uh, and start doing the violence again. When in reality, they were a lot of these folks were trying to bail out protesters. They they you know were there people? Was there a danger of bailing out people who were violent? Yeah. But they were weighing it against it and going, there's a bunch of people being in there or they can't afford bail. And so this idea that, you know, they're, they're going to stay in jail. But believe me, the a lot of the uh, Portland Antifa kids, their parents are fairly well to do. They made bail. Meanwhile, the like the the uh, George Floyd protesters, the black kids who came down there just to walk signs and and protest. There's some of that. There's an argument that some of them needed help with bail. So what he's want, what he's saying right now is, you know, they were trying to get these people out so they could get, they could do more violence. Well, here you go, fucko. Get them out. Raise funds. Get get these guys lawyers. We're worried about they don't have representation. Get them representation. Start a fund. You assholes are making money. He's making money hand over fist. He and Marjorie Taylor Greene. I mean, the funding has dropped off significantly, but Marjorie Taylor Greene is the highest earning, uh, you know, the, like she gets more donations than any other House Republican. And they're touring together. They, they could absolutely start a legal fund for these folks. And it would fill up with money. They're not going to. They will not. You know Why? Because they don't want them to fuck out. Because those people are crazy. They are The people who aren't out already are crazy. They're dangerous. They, they want out so they can start this shit again. in that uh, domestic terrorism that was so troubling, but give the left this credit. They did vertically integrate their strategy to do this violence. George Soros elected a lot of DA. Wow, we went straight to Super Jew. That was quick. Was he halfway? Yeah, four minutes in. All around the country that were ready and willing to drop charges so long as the politics that motivated the violence was left-wing politics. Okay, so George Soros was willing to get out uh, violent protesters, rioters, looters, so long as the politics of those rioters and looters, which you can't really say exists, are, is left-wing. I guess what he means is like kind of, uh, you know, anarchists, Marxist anarchists among the, amongst Antifa. That's the allegation he's making. Instead of people who are actually protesting uh, George Floyd um, and police brutality that led to most of these protests over the time and then the pushback from the areas that they were in, which um, we've, we've litigated this a lot last year. But interestingly enough, he's now arguing that as long as their politics are right, George Soros is willing to bail them out that they deserve to, to get out, which is exactly what Matt Gates is arguing about people who violently attacked cops and the Capitol and our democracy. So what he's saying is that there should be a moral equivalency. So he's not, understand, he's not casting aspersions on Soros and the, the, the left-wing mob or something. He's saying, we, us too, which is obviously born out of his projection of that there is no bottom morally. Now, we'll keep it with Pelosi, uh, this, this committee to investigate January 6th. They've received, as you already alluded to, private phone records of Republican members of Congress. Leader McCarthy has said he's going to, he's going to get accountability for this happening. Are you buying that? No, he's not going to. That's just silly. It's, it's ridiculous. There will not be accountability. There's, you, know, here, you know what the accountability would be? If, if Kevin McCarthy thinks he's going to get accountability, here's what accountability looks like when a subpoena comes from the Congress of the United States that says preserve records you preserve those records. And if you don't, uh, there will be uh, fines. Your business might get shut down. Um, you might be viewed as engaging in criminal activity or, or, or uh, you know, RICO statutes being what they are. That That's what accountability actually is. Yeah, the Soros fable is going to, I mean, they have to throw it in there because know your audience, I guess. Uh, if Kevin McCarthy really wanted accountability for the Stalinist tactics of the January. The Stalinist tactics, dude. 
Stalin would have used their gallows against them and filmed it. Committee, he would remove Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger from the committees that they serve on as a consequence of their membership in the Republican conference. You mentioned in the their membership in the because they're Republicans, they can't be on the January 6th commission because you don't want anyone there that won't sell your line. The highly important hearing earlier today with Secretary of State Blinken. Well, a Adam Kinzinger got Republican time to ask questions in that committee. Liz Cheney was a part of drafting the National Defense Authorization Act, serving on the House Armed Services Committee. Cheney. Yeah, that's, I mean, this is just now sour grapes because you're not on a committee. Well, Kinzinger not sour grapes, technically not jealousy on our team anymore. They've crossed the Rubicon and they are supporting these very Stalinist efforts through this January 6th committee to go after colleagues because of our politics. Stalinist. Stalinist. Look, dude, detainees, regime, I, yeah. Stalinist? Can you imagine being this much of a wuss? Did they get the phone records? No, they've they are requesting, what they did was ask them to preserve the records because they're going to get them from the members of Congress. They'll subpoena them from them. If they don't get them, they will get them from the company. If they get them from the congressperson that they are asking, they will also ask the company to see if they match. I, like the, Stal the Stalinist bullshit is just cartoonish. It has to be, this is what happens. This is what happens when it has to be so monstrous. It has to be so gigantic, like, like, I mean, this is, and by the way, the reason they use Stalin is because uh, the, the left uses Hitler all the time. So, uh, because, you know, Trump gets called Cheeto Hitler, or, you know, he gets called Skidler, or whatever, that, um, <laughs> which is like the Skidmark version of Stifler, I think. But, um, they, they, he needs that to be, like, an equivalent of, of like, oh yeah, you call me Hitler, well, I'm calling you Stalin. That's that's what they're doing. It, they're, this is about zeroing it out. And again, this comes from the whole idea of fight language in general. This is when you start talking in terms of fighting or you start using, you know, uh, ad hominem attacks or stacking them and you're not funny about it. Um, it what they do is they just throw back an ad hominem and then that's that's the debate. That's the whole thing. Yeah, it's a neener neener. Absolutely, Francie. And the fact that they're doing that and, and the fact that they face no consequence from McCarthy regarding committee removal really raises doubt as to whether or not Kevin will, uh, you know, bring the, the level of vigor that we need to oversight and accountability when we ultimately take power. I mean, look, we need to be getting rid of Blinken. We should be impeaching him. We should be having far tougher oversight on General Milley, not just from the failures in Afghanistan, but even from these new revelations, Chris, that General General Milley actually placed himself above the president of the United States, above the commander in chief. Well, the, you know, they did this when Nixon was losing his mind too, and he was drunk and yelling at paintings. This is, this is part of it. And they'll follow a lawful order. If Congress, if, by, by the way, if, if the president said we're striking China and Congress agreed, he'd carry it out. He just won't let him do it unilaterally. Uh, in which the, he shouldn't recent revel revelation so i think these are very dangerous by the way they're talking about uh revelations from the book peril from uh bob woodward and is it jim acosta did he write it with it, it with him i think um yeah it's above illegal orders exactly it's a mess this whole like well i think they need to be removed from their positions of power and i think we need yeah dude that that's what you've got on deck elect Republicans in 2022 who will actually do it, who will go beyond talking about it and will actually do it. I want to expand on what you just brought up. Bob Woodward's new book alleging uh, some very disturbing details. That so it's not, so just so that, for the record, Bob Woodward is a trusted source. Chris Salcedo, Matt Gates. Are, are we now? Oh, it's Bob Acosta. Yeah, thank you, Bob Acosta. I, I, I couldn't remember who did the, who co-wrote it with him. Um, so, so for the record, we're going on record right now, Bob Woodward and, and, and Robert Costa, 
Both of those guys are good sources. So any criticism you have of Millie, any criticism you have of Nancy Pelosi that you're going to bring from this book is predicated entirely on the idea that if Bob Woodward and Robert Costa say it, it's true. Because if that's the case, then we need to go back to some of Bob Woodward's reporting on Trump, especially about the beginning of the pandemic, and him downplaying it, even, even though he knew it was far more deadly, and start, start talking about the tens of thousands of dead Americans uh, on top of who we would have lost naturally because of this tragedy. Because it is, you're on shaky ground. This is like, they do this shit all the time. It's the fake news, the mainstream news, the lamestream news is bullshit and it's bullshit or whatever. But even, but if you look at what the New York Times wrote right here, they even say that Biden is blah, blah, blah. Like, right? That's what, it, it's so goddamn lazy. Am I going to read the book? Yes, I will. I read all of them. I've, I've got, I don't um, have, uh, like, I, digi I get them digitally usually on my iPad. Days after the January 6th events, the, uh, the riots, General Milley reportedly broke the chain of command, went around President Trump, and assured his counterpart in communist China that if President Trump had ordered an attack on China, that Milley would warn China, potentially leading to the slaughter of Americans. Well, no, he would call him when it was happening. The missiles are away, hallelujah, click. But again, I... I would like to say, more than anything, from this point on, Chris Salcedo and Matt Gates, as you quote this, there is no putting this genie back in the bottle. There is no shoving the snake back in the Pringles can. There is no um, re retucking the turtle. You now, and this is the state, this is the, this has to be the position going forward of Newsmax, of Chris Salcedo of Matt Gates that if Bob Woodward says it, it's true. Service members. If yes, it is a dead zone reference I made. And uh, did you read? I alone can fix it. Yes. I don't think his resignation is going to be enough. Do you, Congressman? Uh, I don't believe everything I read in a Bob Woodward book until folks get under oath. But these questions have to be asked. See, he, he, he knows... He knows the game that's playing. Salcedo's all in though, and he just he just he he pulled a tucker. Oh, Matt Gates, he just tuckered Chris Salcedo. Both immediately, and if true, General Milley has broken some very good laws, and we ought to some some very good laws. There's some bad laws, you know, like I don't know, like a thirty something or a, a late twenties congressman from a shit district in northern Florida flying a 17-year-old girl to Georgia for the weekend to fuck her and drug her. You know, that would be a... That's a bad law. Who even needs that? I'm sure that there uh, is accountability for that. Uh, by the way, can I just say for the record, if, you, if you're horrified by the Larry Nassar thing, understand that the Jim Jordan scandal and what... And Matt Gaetz's... Uh, Joel Greenberg and the crowd around him and, and Matt's father and all that shit. Same thing. They're just males. The victims are male. Half of the reason why Jim Jordan skates on a lot of his shit about this, it, you know, and, in a way that Nasser isn't, is because the victims are male. Because nobody wants to talk about it. It's even worse. In their minds. If you were horrified by the Larry Nasser thing, that's exactly the kind of shit that that Jim Jordan let slide. I mean, this is someone who already viewed his role, I think, as rather outsized. He went beyond giving military advice and wanting to be a critical race theorist and wanting to transform the. He was asked about racial stuff in the ranks, and he's he's got to look into it. I, I love how the 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 key. A uh, trait of a leader in the GOP is uh, incuriosity. Just the the pathological desire to not give a shit if it doesn't serve you directly. 
justice goals of the military. All the while, they didn't plan for the one thing that actually happened in Afghanistan. Your preamble laid out the reason for the failure in Afghanistan was a lack of planning, a belief in the law. Well, yeah, for a year, Trump didn't, you know, hamstrung the entire uh, SIV program. And had they done all that stuff, the Biden administration and everybody else could have focused on other stuff. But they were they were doing Trump's job while they were doing the regular exit that was hard enough anyways. So, yes, yeah, there's tons of the lack of planning, and, you know, and the fact that it could have happened last year or the year before that or the uh, year before that told over and over again that somehow the Afghan government was going to stand up and fight and facilitate further American departure and withdrawal. The reality is that Afghanistan government was just a mirage and it faded into this. Right. And it was a mirage last year and it was a mirage the year before that. And it was a mirage the year Trump came into office. And it was a mirage the year he gave his speech about staying in there a little while longer. And yet it was Biden that got us out. And, and you know what? When Ghani told Biden that they were facing a full-scale invasion from the Taliban, Biden told Ghani to lie. So think about it. These Democrats impeached Donald Trump for trying to get a foreign leader to tell No, he didn't tell him to lie. It may or may not be true about that circumstance, but you need to stand up and project a different image because if they think you're soft, they're going to kill you. They're going to roll straight through. Now, Biden didn't know at that point that Ghani was already already had his bags packed and he was ready to leave. But what's what's the alternative? We've done this with, I mean, Trump said the same shit. We've seen everybody else argue this stupid point. What what does the Biden presser look like where he comes out and tells the world the truth about how shitty the Afghan military and government are while we're trying to get our people out? While our people are in harm's way. Fuck, man. I don't know why the, I don't know why the, I mean, if I was the Taliban, I'd double my effort. Just wipe them out. Just drive straight. I mean, Jesus, nobody can. They suck. They're not even armed. These guys don't even know what they're doing. He asked for a PR style statement. Exactly. The truth about corruption. And then they back Joe Biden when he gets a foreign leader to lie, resulting in the death of 13 American Marines. Well, the lie didn't result in uh, the death of 13 American Marines. The lack of preparation last year for the SIV program that meant they had to do everything and that during the evacuation uh, with only an extra three months that they can negotiate with the Taliban where our own soldiers wouldn't be shot at all over the country. Well, uh, back to the subject of Milley, I, I will say that uh, Senator Rubio, we are hearing, is calling for him uh, to be fired by this administration. We'll see where this... Oh, well, gosh, tick-tock. ...goes, and I think you're right to have skepticism, Congressman. Al, you've got trolls on here cussing and swearing, basket. Oh. Um, by the way, uh, trolls, you'll get kicked to the curb if you swear and that kind of stuff, but a, a lot of times, I, I have to, um, it's my third Al mentioned, I need to stop and leave the room. I understand, Bob. Um... I want to take this moment, by the way, in, in honor of these two assholes, to thank the trolls who come into our chat room and join us and watch the show. Because it's one thing to hate watch the show, which many of you do, because you recognize that I'm right and I'm not uh, attacking your soul, just your philosophy and your ethics. And uh, and in some cases, your morals. Um, and of course... And your strategy, too. I think your strategy is shit as well. Um, but but the trolls who actually get in the chat room and type things or who watch the show and click on it a bunch or or even use emojis, and it doesn't matter. Uh, your interaction actually drives us up in the algorithm. Uh, more so than even regular viewers do. It's, uh, it's amazing. Because YouTube does not care if you watch the show because you like it or you don't like it. Yeah, give it a thumbs down. The whole, like, ratioing something, th dislikes to likes doesn't matter. For as far as ad rev and helping the show out and boosting it in the algorithm, literally the algorithm uh, the algorithm does not care if it has more dislikes than likes. It really doesn't. It's the interaction they like. So if you type anything, what the algorithm says is, holy shit, this guy's engaging. I'm not kidding. That's how it works. So if you do... If you, I mean, if you do nothing, if you just sit back and scream at your laptop, uh, that's uh, that's fine. Do it, do you? But if you ever get in the chat and you're writing stuff or you're typing things, you have to understand that 
it it helps the show. The only time you'll ever get bounced is if you use bad language or you're, uh, you know, you're cruel. So, and and if and when you are, that just it just exemplifies exactly what I'm talking about. That you are um, in serious, emotionally uh, idiotic, and and you don't really care about the things you presume to care about. There is no conservatism anymore. Trump is just your leader and you're just following him. That's it. But I appreciate you being here. I I, did, I should have said it earlier in the show. That, but, you know, we went long today. Um, and we got a full chat room. There's like almost 900 people just in the YouTube room by itself. So the rest of you that are, you know, ghosting around Facebook, ghosting around Twitch, ghosting around YouTube, watching the thing and getting angry and type of stuff, I have to know. You're, I, 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 need, I need you to know that you're boosting the show. So thanks a lot. 